looking only unto Jesus as I onward go. Well, we've been looking at the path for growth in Jesus, God's power for growing, to be more like Jesus. And now, just in the last couple of verses, briefly, uh, God's plan, some aspects of God's plan, how he lays that out in practical details for us in verses 14 to 18 for our growth. God's plan for our growth shows that he cares about our hearts as much as our outward lives. His purpose is to conform both our hearts and our lives to be more and more like Jesus. So we read here in verse 14, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. First, we start in God's plan with an attitude of heart. We're all familiar with the picture of children complaining to their parents, maybe out in the shop somewhere uh, that they, they didn't get what they wanted, or maybe arguing with one another uh, on the playground or at the wreck or somewhere like that. But actually, uh, it's not just children who complain and argue, is it? I don't know if it, there's been a time that's been very different, but certainly these days it seems popular to criticize, to complain. Sadly, instead of showing that we're somehow smarter than others, actually it just shows that we're selfish and think we know better than others and want things our own way. But apparently that's part and parcel of living in a crooked and depraved generation. Now, when Paul says this, he's not saying, ah, but you and I are naturally better than everybody else, aren't we? No, not at all. Not naturally. That's why he has to tell them. Do all these things without arguing or complaining because naturally we are like everybody else we need God's help to grow to be more like Jesus not arguers and complainers criticizers and grumblers so what about us you and me how are we doing are we any different to a grumbling, complaining, critical world? Or have we fallen into that as well? And specifically, as we seek a life of following Jesus and obeying him. Well, we've been told here in chapter two that we're, we're meant to um, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In verse 3, in humility, value others above yourself. And, and verse 4, each of you don't look only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Verse 5, have that attitude of Jesus. Well, if we are trying to obey God and serve others and imitate Jesus outwardly, but inwardly, are doing it grudgingly, with grumbling heart, and in a complaining manner, then that doesn't please God, and that won't honor Jesus. And we won't be growing more like him, even if we're trying to do things in a religious way. No, do everything without complaining, or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Those that uh, are different in a godly way, in a Jesus-like way. And this is what others need to see because society is dark with selfishness and greed and anger and division especially in these times. Who's going to shine out with the light of Jesus? We can, 
with the power of God at work in our lives as we seek to obey him, but with a different attitude of heart. If we let go of seeking ourselves and look to follow our Savior, if we let the Spirit of Christ retrain our hearts, we can learn to gladly and willingly obey God. Love our neighbor. Serve our brothers and sisters in Jesus. And instead of trying to grab and get for me, I can leave the outcome to God, knowing I've already been given amazing grace and promised glory through Jesus, my Savior. If we do live like this, it will make a difference. Now, I, I just want to say briefly, that doesn't mean that Christians will never disagree and can't ever disagree. Sometimes we will. But the issue is, how will we work that through? How will we work that out? In our hearts, in our words, in our actions. With love, with gratitude to God. With kindness and humility towards one another. That's what we're called to. And if and when we do, well, that will be an example that will shine out the light of Christ to others around us. So first, an attitude without complaining or arguing. That's one part of the plan for our growth. Along with that attitude is an anchor, verse 16, as we hold fast to the word of life. In order that Paul says, I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Paul came to the Philippians with the message of Jesus. Others have come to us with the message of Jesus. Did they do that for no reason? With no effect? Well, not if we hold fast to the word of life. Yes, there will be temptations and challenges from other people, through other circumstances, from our own hearts. But we need to hold tight to this anchor, the word of God and the word of life. And especially that is Jesus himself. Because all of the word of God points to Jesus. And as John 1 says, he is the word himself. So let's not let other people or circumstances or, or other offers of the world around us distract us or draw us away or lead us into doubt. God's word draws us to and grows us in life with Jesus. There is no other. This is the word of life. And as I read this, I, I was thinking about one of those life-saving rings that you see sometimes beside a river or a lake um, that, can, that, it, that is there ready to be thrown to somebody in need. And, and we're told to, to recognize that, that we need to hold on to the word of God and the gospel of Jesus as our salvation. But it's not just something for us to hold on to. It's also something for us to hold out to others who are drowning, who are lost without Jesus. In fact, this, this passage is, is slightly difficult to translate because it could be either holding on to or holding out. And I can't help but think perhaps Paul meant both. And that's why he used this term. The plan for our growth in Jesus is with an attitude that doesn't complain or argue, but is humble and grateful. With an anchor holding fast to and holding out the word of life. And what's the outcome? Verses 17 and 18. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering, Paul writes, on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. What's he saying? Well, even if my life has to go, for Jesus' sake and for your sake in Jesus, I'll rejoice. And the outcome of growing in Christ's likeness, of following and obeying him, of trusting in his power and letting his power change us and serving together, unified 
in Jesus, to hold out the word of Jesus to a lost and dying world. The outcome, the byproduct will be rejoicing together. As we grow in all we've been hearing here in chapter two, we don't lose out on anything. We gain. As we serve in love and humility and grow in gratitude and unity in Christ. Well, because we love him and he loves us, this will draw us deeper into the enjoyment of that love and of that life. It will contribute to our mutual growth in deep joy as we glorify Jesus and look forward to all he's doing and will do towards the day that he returns. What about us? Let's ask God's help to walk in his plan with an attitude that is given by Christ through his Holy Spirit, an anchor of holding fast to him and with growing joy that we can share with one another and others in Jesus, our Savior. We're going to hear another song. And again, I invite you to join in singing along with it and making it a song uh, from you to the Lord as well. All I have and all I am is yours. Just as all he has and is, he's given for us. And after this song, we'll come back for a closing prayer. <laughs>